Hi, welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm so grateful you're able to join us. My name's Leanne Atkin. I'm a vascular nurse specialist at Mid Yorks NHS Trust and lecturer practitioner at Huddersfield University. We're here as a two part webinar. It's the first webinar from Wounds UK in partnership with LNR. The, the whole overarching theme of these webinars is to talk to you about the best practice for the holistic management of venous leg ulceration. This first part of the webinar, though, is going to concentrate on wound bed assessment. Just to set the scene a little bit, I'm sure you're all aware of the impact of venous leg ulcer for patients. It's something that we see day in day in clinical practice. 1.5% of the adult population is known to have a leg ulcer during any one period of time. This accounts for over 730,000 patients within the whole of the UK, which is a massive amount. And I'm sure any of you practicing nurses out there know how big this is for you in terms of day to day practice and the burden this gives you in terms of your service delivery. Venus leg also has a huge impact in terms of finances and it is something that's now on the radar of a lot of the local commissioning groups. Despite knowing the treatment for venous leg ulcer is compression, it's rather disheartening to say that we know from recent papers by Guest and Vowden that up to only 16% of leg ulcers have had a documented ABPI assessment. When you hear that figure, it is rather disheartening of how can that be? How can we be failing our patients to such a degree? In all, this costs over £600 million a year for the NHS services. This is not a small fish anymore. This is a huge impact for all of us. And the difficulty with all of this is that we know that the recurrence rates are high. It's documented of venous leg ulcer recurrence rates between, be, be, being between 26 and 69%. But what can we do to help all of this? Well, it's definitely certain that the NHS needs a solution and actually patients deserve better. As I'm sure you're aware, the NHS um, getting, right first care time, getting care right first time um, is largely within the NHS at this moment in time. They have done some great scenarios from NHS England looking at the cost of getting optimum care at the right point and the right time versus substandard care. And I encourage you all to have a look at this Betty's story. It's in the NHS England website and it tells you the tale of a patient that you will be able to recognise. Betty is somebody that you have treated, that you have watched their pathways of care. And unfortunately and extremely disheartening is when NHS England looked at this, they found that normal care, which is suboptimal, actually cost 10 times more than the optimal care. Now, I am a practicing nurse and finances are very, very important to me. However, what about the patient suffering from all of that? Yes, it's cost more, but that patient's had a merry-go-round of treatments and none of them have been effective. Surely that's not right. So NHS England are working about getting the right care at the right time and you will see that there's lots of change happening, especially in terms of sequins looking at wound management and we are hopeful that there is some going to be some lower limb guidance from NHS England and hopefully, fingers crossed, one day there'll be a sequin associated with this. But what can we do here and now? Well, hopefully many of you will be aware of the new best practice statement on the holistic management of venous leg ulceration, which was launched at Wounds UK last year. It aims to meet the needs of all the UK clinicians, putting patients in the heart of everything that we do. It aims to provide clear treatment pathways that promotes consistency of best practice, using evidence-based uh, processes to ensure that patients get the best outcomes. But it also provides a real world solutions of the, of the service challenges that we're all facing. And it hopefully dispels some of the terrible myths that's out there that underpins this ritualistic practice. So is leg ulceration underpinned by um, evidence and practice? Well, there is lots of things out there at the moment that actually exacerbates the problem rather than makes things better. And one of my greatest bugbears is the old fashioned definition of what is a venous leg ulcer. The venous leg ulcer definition that we all tend to use is the one from the RCN guidelines back in 1998. 1998 is now 18, 19 years ago. Things have changed since then. The definition states that it's a break in the epithelial surface that's been present for a period of six weeks. But if you look at the slide, you can see that that initial tit skin tear, if it looks like that after two weeks, what's the chances of getting that to heal within that six week time frame? Practically zero. 
should we be intervening a little bit earlier in terms of our therapies to help to expedite healing? And it's rather strange and very oddly to teach that a wound can be present on a leg for five weeks and six days and it goes to bed that night and it wakes up in the morning and has a birthday and now it's turned into an ulcer. It doesn't make sense and it's something that we need to be challenging in everyday practice. One of the great myths that's been within this document is that the limb, that the wound should be present for a period of six weeks prior to any form of assessment. We challenge this and we challenge it directly to say that we should be thinking about other factors that's delaying wound healing only after a period of two weeks, especially in legs where they've had previous ulceration, there's any signs of any skin changes or any signs of any form of edema. About the patient though, it's about making accurate diagnosis and getting things right at the right time. Because all patients require a thorough holistic assessment and this needs to be timely. Any patient who has a lower leg wound should be assessed for signs of venous disease and signs of chronic edema that could delay healing because we know the earlier our interventions, the quicker the chances we've got of getting these wounds to heal and all of that ultimately results in reduced patient suffering. So where do you start? Well, you start with the assessment and diagnosis of venous leg ulcers like you do with anything else. It starts with the wound management. It starts with trying to prepare that wound bed for healing. It has to be a holistic approach, looking at the whole of the patient and factors that could be delaying healing, not just at the limb and the wound in isolation. And we have to ensure that we are setting realistic goal settings for our patients so they have realistic expectations. So, in essence, the diagnosis and assessment of leg ulcer starts with a general assessment of the whole of the patient. It looks at the leg assessment, what's happening to the lower leg, and then it focuses on the wound. This first stage of this webinar is going to concentrate on that third point, the assessment of the wound in preparation of that wound bed for healing. I'm a vascular nurse by background. With anything, that you have to start looking back at the pathophysiology. Why did this wound occur? What caused the break in the skin? Breaks in the skin don't happen for no apparent reason. There is an underlying cause, and this is where we need to start. Think about what you know. What options do you think of what causes the skin to break down? There's many reasons. There's arterial insufficiency, venous insufficiency, trauma, whether intentional through surgery or unintentional, pressure, malignancy, infection, autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis and other factors. But this is where you need to start. If you look at that slide and you see those necrotic toes on the top of the right picture, that's caused by peripheral arterial disease and arterial insufficiency. There's no point in telling the patient that that's going to heal. There's no point in spending a fortune on expensive dressings. The only thing that's going to help that patient is revascularization. We need to ensure that the underlying pathophysiology is assessed and optimised and that needs to be the start of the journey programme. The second wound that you can see on that slide is a large necrotic wound and you can imagine the odour that came from that wound. There's underlying osteomyelitis of the tibia and fibula behind that. No dressing is going to solve that. That needs orthopaedic input. We need to be considering what is the long-term solutions. I mentioned earlier about patients' expectations. I challenge you all out there to try to inform your patients of what you know. If you look at those necrotic toes, how many of you out there will think that they will go on to heal? I doubt that any of you think that they will go on to heal, but how many of you out there have those terrible conversations with patients explaining to them that your toes are going gangrenous, that they are going to drop off, that we're not going to be able to get those to heal. The best we possibly can for you is to keep you pain free and infection free. Setting those realistic goals and having those difficult conversations with patients really helps that patient practitioner relationship, ensuring that that patient trusts you and your recommendations. So that's where you need to start. We need to start looking at the underlying etiology. Once we've got that, then we can start to look at the wound itself. I hope many of you out there have already heard of times. Times to me is something that I wish I was taught as a student nurse. 
It provides a structured, systematic approach to wound bed assessment. It aims to look at what are the barriers locally of the wound that could be delaying wound healing. And I'm going to go more into this further on. So TIMES has been around for a long period of time now. I think it was back in um, early 1990s when Schulk first wrote about this. It stands for five basic principles of wound bed assessment. And we're going to go through each and one, every one of these. And I challenge you all to apply this systematic approach to wound bed assessment with each and every patient that you visit. Please don't think that I'm wanting you to complete reams of paperwork with that. Once you get skilled at using times, you can assess a wound in less than three minutes in that systematic approach, ensuring that you've got appropriate goals with clear goal settings for you and your patients and your colleagues. So just to recap, the management has to start with the treatment of the underlying pathophysiology. That's where you need to begin. But then we need to look at the wound bed to try to prepare that wound in terms of optimising its chances of healing and accelerating its healing. We need to manage the factors that impact on wound healing, such as diabetic control, such as cardiac um, perfusion. All of that is extremely important, and so is pain and nutrition management. But unfortunately, we've not got time to cover that today. And I will state that we need to ensure that we're doing continual assessments on patients. This should not be just at the start of their journey programme when you've assessed them once and never again. This should be at each and every dressing change. So TIMES, what does it stand for? Well, it stands simply for tissue. Is the tissue viable or non-viable? I, infection, is there any evidence of increased infect amount of bacterial burden that's causing infection or chronic inflammation? And is there a presence of biofilm? M, what is the moisture balance of the wound? Is the wound bed too wet or is the wound bed too dry? And E, wound edges, is there evidence of the wound edges advancing or is there any evidence of undermining? And some of you that's been in this game for long enough will notice that there's been a new S added to times. It now asks you to look at the surrounding skin, which as a vascular nurse is vital because the skin, tear, skin care surrounding the ulcer is as important as the treatment of the ulcer itself. So let's just focus on those one by one. T, tissue viable or non-viable? It's a simple question to ask you. Is the tissue viable or not? Viable means, is it healthy? Is it alive? And if you look at these three pictures of these wounds, you can see that on the far left, there is a necrotic wound, which is covered with black tissue and eschar. Please don't be worried about the terminology using eschar or necrotic tissue. They can be used interchangeably. Necrotic means dead, eschar means black and leathery. I do think sometimes in nursing we just put two terminologies with a lot of things just to try to confuse the junior staff. The middle wound you can see is covered with some sluffy tissue, that yellow fibrous tissue that you can see. And then the final wound you can see has got beautiful pink healthy granulation tissue. By looking at those three wounds you can separate them into two simple groups. Those with non-viable tissue, those with the eschar or the sluffy tissue and those with the healthy granulation tissue. What do you want to do to those wounds that's got those non-viable tissue? Well, the answer is you want to debride them. And we know that there's many options out there in terms of debridement. All of the dressings that are used within the UK at this moment in time help to facilitate the body's natural response to encourage that autolytic process. A lot of the dressing companies will tell you that their dressings heal wounds. It's the body that heals the wound. All they do is provide the perfect environment for that to be facilitated. Autolysis is the body's natural response. It provides extra moisture to the level of the wound. So if you can think of that superficial slough picture from the previous slide, through the layers of the skin, when a dressing is applied, it is encouraged the body to bring fluid through the layers of the skin up to the wound bed slowly um, debriding that sluffy tissue through that process of autolysis. The other options you've got in terms of debridement is sharp or surgical debridement, but obviously that is costly if it's surgical because it requires 30 space. In terms of sharp debridement, it is quick and, and, and relatively cost effective, but it has to be done only in competent hands. 
One of my favourite um, options for debridement is larva therapy. You can see them quite actively chewing on this diabetic foot ulcer. Larva therapy is a great option in terms of being able to debride because it's extremely selective. The maggots will never attack any good healthy tissue. All they will ever help to digest is that necrotic or sloughy tissue. It's interesting with the maggots that you can see on this slide that these are actually free range maggots. So they're able to get into all the nooks and crannies of the wounds. There is a bit of a yuck factor for them, both for the patients and for the nurses. However, in today's world, you can get maggots now in tea bags. Within the US, there's still chemical debridement. Um, there's not any currently within the UK. If some of you are old enough who's listening to this, I'm sure you'll be able to remember USOL, a university solution of lime, which is bleach, um, acetic acid, which is vinegar, um, and streptokyanase that used to come in two little bottles that you used to twist up and down. Um, all of those were very effective in, in terms of killing uh, the bacteria and removing uh, devitalised tissue. All of them also affected the health of granulation tissue. Hence why currently none are recommended within the UK. I used to say that about mechanical debridement that we're not using it. Mechanical debridement used to mean wet to dry gauze as practised over in the third world and sometimes still in America. That's where you get a piece of wet gauze, you put it onto a wound itself, you allow the gauze to dry away and then you wax the wound bed, removing the devitalised tissue but also causing trauma to that healthy tissue. Obviously that's not been practised within the UK for a while. But then LNR came up with something called Debrasoft, which is a form of mechanical debridement. As an academic, I'm constantly asked for what's the evidence behind what we are doing? Where is your scientific research? Interestingly, Debrasoft is one of the only products out there that's actually got nice technology appraisal to say that it's cost effective in its use. Debrasoft is fantastic at mechanically debriding any superficial slough. It's not great on any eschar or any dried um, adhered tissue, but if you have got slough that's starting to lift um, dry skin cells, excoriated skin around it, any types of skin plaques, and the slough is quite heavily um, full of exudate and a little bit like mozzarella cheese on a pizza, Debrasoft is fantastic at removing this. It's a bit of a magic pad. You can see it working in front of your eyes. And there's growing evidence that this mechanical rubbing of the wound facilitates removal of the dead tissue, but it also can impact on the formation of the biofilm by disrupting that biofilm, allowing the wound products to get right to the heart of the wound. And you can see that only after one application of Debrasoft, what a difference it made in terms of this patient's leg. One application, it's a bit of a magic pad. You can see that all majority of the superficial slough has been completely removed. This has removed the barrier. It's now going to allow that wound to heal. We need to debride a wound before being allowed to move it on to the next stage. So consider what options you've got with debridement. The first T in time is to ask yourself, is there any evidence of devitalised tissue? If there is, you need to set a wound management plan in terms of your aim is to debride the wound. I encourage you all to think about, especially community nurses out there, to think about what goals you are setting in your wound care plans. Please try to avoid writing the words aim to promote wound healing. What does that mean? How is that measurable? How can your colleague who goes in next be able to assess whether that's happening or not? It's an unmeasurable aim. If you though put on your wound documentation that there is a wound covered 100% slough and your aim is to debride this and you've chose product X, when your colleague goes in three or four days later, they're gonna easily be able to see whether that wound is debriding or not. It makes your colleague's life easier and it also stops that swapping and changing of wound products that we know can be so costly to the NHS. So that's T. Tissue, is it viable or non-viable? The next point of time is I, infection. Is there any evidence of infection or increased inflammation or bacterial burden? I just want to bring you back to what infection really means. Infection means a microbiology gro micro microbial sorry, growth, multiplication and invasion of the host. It's that little bit at the end that's very, very important. It's the invasion of the host. It's those systemic responses to infection, 
only when you're having those systemic responses to infection can you class it truly as infection. And I say that because most chronic wounds will have a degree of bacteria within them, but it doesn't mean that you've got systemic infection. In some cases, this will just be critical colonization or local infection. It will be just on the base of the wound bed itself. As you can see from this slide, there's evidence of pseudomonas colonization within that wound. But that patient's showing no signs of any systemic response. There is no heat surrounding it. There's no evidence of any spreading cellulitis. The patient's feeling generally well. They're not complaining of any malaise. There is no temperatures. There's no response in terms of their inflammatory markers. Their white cell count, ERCP, it's e CRPs and ESRs are all normal. This is not a spreading infection. This is simply a colonization of the wound bed. As mentioned before though, there is emerging evidence in terms of biofilms and having a biofilm pathway embedded within your chronic wound service is of benefit. I encourage you all, to, there's no time to cover it today, but go and have a read of the best practice statements that Wounds UK have produced relating to biofilm and their management, uh, as it certainly is an immersing area at this moment in time. As mentioned, we've said already that there will be bacteria on any chronic wound. Wounds are not sterile. Even a surgical wound after 48 hours will have a degree of bacteria on them. Having bacteria on the wound does not mean that the patient has an infection. And if you think about that, therefore, a wound swab will not confirm or deny the presence of an infection. A wound swab will only confirm or deny the presence of bacteria on the wound itself. So why take a wound swab? The, the diagnosis of infection should be based on clinical signs and symptoms and that alone. Wound swabs are only of benefit once you think that you're going to start that patient on antibiotics to check the specificity and the sensitivity of those antibiotics. And as such, wound swabs should not be taken routinely. Yes, they are required in MRSA screening if the patient's going in and out of inpatient environments, but they should not be taken routinely in terms of chronic wound management. Because unfortunately what happens every day in practice is that the results of wound swabs are seen in isolation. How many of you community nurses out there have seen a patient with a pseudomonas colonisation? You go in and you think that they've got pseudomonas colonisation and you start them on an appropriate antimicrobial but you take a wound swab at the same time. The wound swab flies off to the GP. You go back to see the patient five days later, the wound is responding beautifully and well. You go back the further week and the patient says, oh, I've just had a course of antibiotics. And you go, why? And the patient says, oh, it's because my wound swab showed that I've got an infection. Because what happens with those wound swab is the results get seen in isolation by the GP. The GP looks in their system ones or electronic records and sees that, that patient has a chronic wound and a positive wound swab. So sends out a prescription often for flucloxacillin. But is that really required? Is that really what that, nurse, that community nurse wanted? She was treating it extremely well with topical therapies only. Her only mistake, you could say, was taking the wound swab in the first place. So question, when should you be taking the wound swabs? And to me, it should only be when you are considering starting that patient on antibiotics or if you're screening them in and out of inpatient environments or prior to any type of skin grafting. I'll challenge you all. So if I ask you to look at this next picture and I'll say to you, is that wound infected? Well, you can see that they have classic cellulitis around a port of entry. You can see that there's spreading erythema greater than two centimetres. You can see that there's edema around that area. You can see the heat and the redness coming from that wound. And you can see the described distinct edges between the non-cellulitic area and the cellulitic area. However, you can't diagnose a patient just with a, patient, a, a, a picture alone. As we've already said, a lot of these wounds will have bacteria within them. And you need that further information of what that patient's like systemically before you make that diagnosis. So if I put up that this patient has flu-like symptoms, they're feeling sweaty, they've got a pyrexia and a raised white cell count, then we can all make the clear distinction that this patient is suffering from cellulitis. It's interesting that the management and the diagnosis of infection. If my 
18 year old son comes downstairs and says to me mum I don't want to go to college today I don't feel well the first thing I do is get my thermometer out pop it under his tongue and I say son it's 36.5 go to college but when do we take temperatures of patients anymore when as community nurses or patients uh, uh, nurses with an outpatient environment when do we use that basic nursing skill I know a lot of my community colleagues say we haven't even got a thermometer, Leanne. Well, it's something that I challenge you all to take back to your commissioners of service. Surely that's the most simple of bedside, chairside tests that you can do to help to make that diagnosis of whether that patient has a systemic infection or not. A pyrexia is one of the most indicative things of a spreading infection. It's the same with this patient. You can see the bright green exudate that's coming off the leg. This is Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is your friend. It's the only bacteria that provides that bright green exudate. You do not need a microbiologist to be able to dis diagnose that. If it looks like a fluorescent 1980s sock, it's Pseudomonas. In a way, I wish Streptococcus was blue um, uh, and Strep um, was orange. That would really help us uh, in terms of diagnosis. But Pseudomonas is your friend. You don't need a wound swab to be able to diagnose that. This patient here had increased exudate. You can see the maceration and the extension of the wound bed size. There was a significant malodor, but the patient was feeling generally well. This patient does not require systemic antibiotics. This patient just needs treatment with a topical antimicrobial. And there's some great topical antimicrobials out there. And once again, I encourage you all to refer to the Wounds UK practice statements regarding the management and the appropriate use of topical antimicrobials. But if you have indicated that there is a problem with infection or inflammation, Consider when you should be using those systemic antibiotics. Try to rationalise them. Think about your antibiotic stewardship. When should you be using topical antimicrobials? If there is evidence of increased bacterial burden, you need to do something about the devitalised tissue because that's feeding the bacteria. You need to be thinking about disrupting those biofilms and you need to be managing those patients' exudate. But also, please, please remember the patient's pain. I find it very disheartening sometimes in clinic that patients come to me with legs like this in sopping wet bandages. And they say it's like this every day. Is it appropriate that we leave a patient in a sopping wet bandage? Imagine that very high acidic fluid sat on that extremely sore skin. How painful will that be for the patient? I have an element of OCD. You're not allowed past my doorstep without taking your shoes off. Is it appropriate for somebody with a wet bandage that's got pseudomonas to pad all over their own cream carpets? Why do we find that appropriate? We need to get better in pilling ourselves in that patient's experience and thinking about what that patient is, is experiencing day in, day out. What are we making them live with? Because I certainly do not think it's appropriate in today's world to have significant strike through that's causing such extensive tissue damage like this picture shows. So as mentioned, we should only be using um, the antimicrobials at the far end of the spectrum when there is evidence of clinical colonisation infection. Antimicrobial dressing's got a huge uh, bad press back in, um, in, in the 1990s, early 2000s, um, on the basis of the Vulcan trial that said that there was no requirement to use silver dressings routinely. No, there's not. We've never said that there is. But silver dressings and other antimicrobials are extremely valuable at this end of the colonisation continuum. When there is evidence of critical colonisation or infection, it's extremely useful to be able to reduce that bacterial burden and as mentioned there's some great um, documentation about when to start but also when to stop topical antimicrobials and you can find all of this further information within Wounds UK website. As a, diabetic, as a, a vascular nurse though I just have to mention one thing diabetic foot infection we're trying to change the terminology to foot attack to try to raise it to think more like a heart attack to think about the emergency care. Diabetic foot disease is the reason why young individuals are, using, are losing limbs and lives. This patient here had rapid deterioration of his diabetic foot disease. If this is not escalated 
timely and appropriately we can put patients at risk. These patients won't sign any, show any signs of normal systemic response because of their problems with the diabetes. These patients may not have pyrexia, they may not have blood changes in terms of inflammation. Any patient who has a wound on the foot, the first question you need to be asking them is, are you a diabetic? If they are, are a diabetic, they need escalating in terms of um, referral to um, diabetic MDT clinics. So the I is, is there any problem with infection or inflammation? The next point of time is M, moisture. Moisture control um, is really, really important. Exudate has got a bit of a bad press. Everybody thinks it's bad. We're all trying to dry up these wounds. Exudate is good. Remember that we need exudate to in, in terms of to improve the autolytic um, debridement of the wounds. We also need it to increase the rate of epithelialization and cell proliferation. Exudate is good. The difficulty is, is that high volumes of exudate start to affect the wound adversely because of the high levels of MMPs. If you see this picture here on the top with this very edematous leg, you can see the amount of exudate that's coming but you need to manage the edema of the lower leg in combination with the exudate management. It cannot be done in isolation. So consider, why is the exudate so high? Is it due to bacterial? Is it due to um, problems with edema? Is the patient in the most appropriate compression? Think about using superabsorbent dressings. They retain high volumes of exudate and keep those harmful MMPs away from the wound bed. Majority of the time, it's a problem in terms of wicking away the exudate, especially in the lower legs. It's very rarely you get a problem in terms of the wound bed being too dry, but that can be an issue, so beware of that. And the final point of, of time is the edge. It's about looking and thinking about the wound edge. Are they advancing as they should be? Is there evidence of any undermining? With lower leg management, it's really, really important that you have flags within your treatment pathways to help to identify patients that are not healing appropriately. These two patients that you can see here um, both have underlying skin cancers. That's the reason why they were not healing. I look at those slides and I still struggle to see a skin cancer visually. There's a few clues within them for the trained eye, but they're not classic of skin cancers. The only reason why that these were identified is that we've got very clear pathways in place to say that there, if there isn't improvement in terms of wound bed reduction of 40% at six weeks, we need to do a biopsy. And these biopsies revealed that underlying cause. So just consider if your edges are not improving, think about reassessing the cause. Have you addressed that underlying pathophysiology? Have you addressed the tissue issue, the infection issue, the moisture issue, and the, um, have you got that wound bed most appropriately managed? The new S that's been added is the S in times is for the surrounding skin. I'm so glad that this is here because we've been ignoring the surrounding skin for ages. Especially in lower leg management, it's vital. You can see this irritated venous eczema. If you don't manage that well, it will turn into an ulcer. We need to think about encouraging the patients to self-care, to apply emollients, to remove the skin plaques, to use Debra Softs to be able to get rid of some of the skin scaling. Because if you're able to moisturise and remove the skin plaques. You can see just from, again, one application of Debrisoft, what's it done from this dry, scaly, placky skin with some Debrisoft and some emollients, look at the difference it can be made. So, just to recap, you need to be considering times at every stage of your wound assessment. If you identify there's a tissue problem, your aim needs to be to bride this. If you identify that there's an infection problem, your aim needs to reduce the bacterial burden. If there is a moisture problem, you need to be able to manage that exudate better or even potentially donate more moisture to the wound bed. With the wound edges, you need to be considering how can you protect these, how can you facilitate them for further epithelialization. And if there's an identified S problem, you need to think in how can you care for that surrounding skin. 
Can you encourage self-care in terms of emollients? Do you need to encourage the patient or can you help with removing the skin plaques, potentially using Deborah Soft for that? By using the principle of times, you'll ensure that you've got the most appropriate aims. Once you've got the appropriate aims, this leads perfectly well to selecting the right product at the right time, ensuring you're using those products appropriately, stepping up to using those products when required, such as antimicrobials, but stepping away from them as soon as they're no longer required. Because when you use the principle of time, you will ensure that you're selecting the right product for the right time. You'll be able to step up to products when you need them, step away from products when you don't. Getting the wound bed prepares gives you the best chance to get venous leg ulcers to heal, but this must be in combination with assessment of the leg and focusing on the compression. All of that will be covered in webinar number two, which is planned for next week. We're going to show you a short video that Eleanor have produced looking at the impact of leg ulceration and getting the right care at the right time. This is going to be played um, as soon as I stop speaking, but I encourage you all now to let's have a chat. If you've got any questions out there, please type them. I'm here to be able to answer your questions. There is no stupid questions. I've never been able to. I've never been asked a stupid question in my life. If you have a question, you need to ask the answer. This is a safe environment for you. Um, all that we're here today is to try to improve patient care because ultimately that's what we want to do. Into we want to make a difference to the patient. We want to get them to heal. We want to do the best we possibly can in the situation that we're currently in. So thank you for listening and I can't wait to answer your questions. They say time is a healer and whilst that may be true for some conditions, with leg ulcers, every moment matters. Fact, a wound on the lower limb can be classed as a leg ulcer after two weeks chronicity, not six weeks. Early compression where appropriate will prevent ulcer development. Fact, currently there are 730,000 leg ulcer patients in the UK, a number that's likely to grow largely because of an aging population. Fact, the NHS needs to save 20 billion pounds by 2020 as part of its five year forward view. Different thinking is needed to reach this target. Fact, self-care is not a new concept. It's a real solution that can improve the healing process. It just needs implementing. And that's where we can help. In 2016, Atkin and Tickle developed the Leg Ulcer Treatment Algorithm, which shows where self-care has to sit in order to work. Adopted by the Best Practice Statement for Holistic Management of Venous Leg Ulcers, and then by NHS organisations, the algorithm shows that using solutions such as hosiery kits can drive self-care to deliver better clinical outcomes, cost savings and improved quality of life. For example, if there isn't a large amount of limb distortion or exudate, a hosiery kit is the ideal solution. But if edema and limb distortion is still present, then an inelastic wrap system is perfect for supporting healing. What makes these products stand out? Activa and Actilymph hosiery kits deliver a measured level of compression, providing peace of mind when applying. Plus, it enables the little things that matter so much, like wearing shoes. For those with edema and limb distortion, Ready Wrap is comfortable to wear, adjustable and colour-coded for easier application. Either way, both products used correctly can give patients their independence back, making them feel more human and that matters. If your patient isn't self-caring yet, not a problem. This can be set as a future goal for patients and their carers. These solutions can be used to prepare your patient for being more able to self-care in the future. So isn't it time we encourage self-care? Self-care empowers patients to say, I can help myself. After all, with leg ulcer treatment, every moment matters.